This episode of A Glass Blower's Companion is brought to you by Mountain Glass Arts. Since 2002, Mountain Glass has been the premier glass company in the United States. Founded by glass artists with the goal of supplying the highest level of customer service. Currently, Mountain Glass is offering weekly sales to help you as an artist save on supplies while staying productive in your studio. Mountain Glass has also temporarily suspended same-day deliveries and in-house shopping, but curbside pickup is available. Because of this, make sure you have created an account and check your emails weekly for sales updates. For any other information and questions, just go to mountainglass.com. That's mountainglass.com. This episode is also brought to you by The Flow Magazine. The Flow Magazine has gone digital. If you are a subscriber or would like to become one, The Flow Magazine is now available in digital form. You will still enjoy relatable articles and tutorials contributed by some of the best artists in the glass community. If you prefer to have a paper copy, The Flow also offers a limited number of print-on-demand copies that you can then hold in your fingertips. These are available while supplies last and please allow three to four weeks for delivery. For more information on how you can subscribe as well as find a complete list of available for more information on how you can subscribe as well as find a complete list of available webinars and ways you can contribute to the magazine, just visit theflowmagazine.com. That's theflowmagazine.com. This is the Wise Guy Radio Show, a podcast dedicated to educating and inspiring through conversations with today's top talents in the world of glass. Hey, hey, what's happening? Welcome to A Glass Blower's Companion, episode 17. How the hell are you doing today? This is a very exciting episode as today features the one and only Robert Mickelson. He is a guest I have wanted to have on this show from day one, uh, early on. For those of you who have been listening to this show for quite some time, I know I've mentioned this before, uh, but early on before I started episode one, I created a list of my top 10 artists I wanted to have on this podcast and pretty much have been able to check off uh, those top 10 uh, the only one that's still on that list is Dale Chihuly, who uh, would love to have on the show. So that being said, this is an exciting sh- episode as uh, Robert and I discuss his 45-year career as a glass artist uh, from his early beginnings where he was started and introduced and how he came to be uh, the artist he is today, uh, as well as uh, some questions that I have never heard anybody ask him before uh, regarding degenerate art, but also his uh transitioning from being in the world of fine art as strictly as just a fine artist uh, to then transitioning into the uh, pipe community. But overall, Mickelson is just a super talented, well-rounded glass artist. Uh, he even had his hands involved in some hot shop work over in Pilchuck and uh, a lot of couple couple different fun things that you may or may not know about him that I'm excited to share in this episode. So I definitely hope you enjoy. Uh, this is definitely a big one for this podcast. Uh, some news going on right now. As for starters, uh, don't forget, as I mentioned in the ads before the show started, uh, make sure you are staying attuned to Mountain Glass. They have weekly sales now. Instead of just doing monthly sales, they're doing them weekly uh, due to the whole COVID thing going on. And they are offering weekly sales to help you as an artist in your studio stay productive and give you opportunities to save money throughout this whole process. As I know, a lot of artists are struggling right now. And a lot of artists are also finding a lot of success right now. It's kind of an interesting moment in this history as being a glassblower or being an artist in general. And I guess just being a human because <laughs> 2020 has been a motherfucker, that's for sure. Uh, so make sure if you have not yet subscribed to their newsletter, all you have to go to do is uh, go to mountainglass.com. You can sign up, create an account there, and then you'll get their weekly emails on all things going on. You can also find them out there in the social medias at uh, Mountain Glass Arts. And you can also follow this podcast Glass Blower's Companion, 
uh, out there too. I'm also constantly promoting them and their sales that are going on. Uh, also, if you are a lady glass artist, the Flow Magazine has taken submissions uh, for the Women's in Glass edition that's coming up here soon. I'll make sure to have all the links in the show notes. Uh, the, the Flow Magazine is now a digital offering, as you heard in the ads, uh, but they are a, still a great way and a great opportunity for any artist out there uh, to get themselves publicized or published uh, into a well-known uh, editorial kind of situation. So definitely check them out. Just go to theflowmagazine.com. Check out the links in the show notes. Um, I'll have Maureen James's email in there. She is a contact that you would submit your work to. And uh, again, if you're a lady glassblower, I uh, hope that you take advantage of this. And uh, I love the fact that they do this every year. They have one of their quarterly issues is dedicated to the female glass artists. Definitely have mad respect for the lady glassblowers. So again, check out the link in the show notes. I'll have that down below in the details of the show. Uh, also, something interesting going on too is that... Uh, Champs is doing their second virtual trade show. I guess the first one was more of an experiment, and they got some good feedback, and I haven't heard anybody personally that I know that attended this thing virtually. Uh, but I know the FAM Glass Show, uh, they are also going to be joining the virtual show at Champs, uh, which is going to be running from September 15th to the 17th. Um, they have like this little FAM community space that will be there. Uh, as we all know, Champs covers anything and everything within the adult tobacco industry. Uh, and the FAM is uh, their goal is to have a space for the American glass artists to be able to promote their, their work virtually, which I think is pretty badass. And again, that's going to be from September 15th through the 17th. So if you're interested in selling some work and getting a little online virtual booth, uh, this would be a great opportunity for you. Uh, also, one other thing, uh, Chris Piazza, who has been on the show four or five times now, uh, he is looking for glass artists uh, to help him with his production line. Uh, he mentioned on the show before that he uh, has begun to grow his business and is at a point now where uh, he's looking for glass artists to help continue some some production lines. These aren't high-end lines of work. These are, these are production lines of work, um, but he is looking for artists. So if you're a new artist or if you're an artist out there, however long you've been doing this for, and uh, maybe struggling right now or looking for an outlet or need a new outlet, uh, definitely hit up Chris Piazza. I'll have his link in the show notes. Um, you can find him on Instagram. He's at Crispy Glass with, with a K. So again, if you're a glass artist, whether you've been doing this for 100 years or you're just brand new and looking for an outlet to sell some work, uh, Chris Piazza is definitely the place to go. So again, I'll have all his information in the show notes. We have lots of things in the show notes this week. Uh, on my end, personally, uh, I'm getting geared up to begin filming episode one of Wise Guy TV, which will be a new series coming to YouTube. Uh, the podcast has been uh, posting on YouTube every time I post a podcast episode. Uh, on YouTube itself, I have categorized every episode. So you have uh, the Glassblower Companion Artist Interviews. You have the Wise Guy Minute series that are all on their own. I've also separated out the Law Talks with Luke Zimmerman. So those are under specifically under their own playlist. So if you want to listen to episodes about law and talk, um, there's a lot of different things on there. Also did uh, early on did a series called So You Want to Be a Glassblower. There's a, uh, the first five episodes of that are on there, but there's also other episodes that I've talked about things that are relating to uh, glass artists that are new in the industry or just ways of marketing yourself and just kind of finding your voice out there as a glass blower. I've made it really easy and organized on YouTube, and it's been a lot of fun getting it all geared up and, and organized. Uh, definitely I've taken advantage of the time that we've had off up until I went back to work. But this is going to be a bi-weekly TV uh, series. So basically the way this podcast is going to work, from I'm trying to publish every week if I can, uh, but ideally, this podcast is going to go to a bi-weekly show, and then the other opposite alternating weeks will be the Wise Guy TV episodes. And uh, I'm going to be using that platform as a way for me to not only get my face on camera, uh, but also just have some fun with video recording and filming. I love doing video work, I, something I've always loved to do. This podcast was just kind of the beginnings of that and the kind of the catalyst to what we're going to now. Uh, but ideally, what I'm going to do is uh, it'll give me a chance to promote the next week's podcast. Um, all my episodes that I'm recording now are all through Zoom. So I can get a, a little bit of video from the Zoom recording with the artist that I interview. I can give a little teaser on that. Um, it's also going to be uh, covering any kind of current events that are going on, like we just talked about with, the, like say, like the, with uh, Champs doing the virtual show. Um, anything like that. And that being said, if you're an artist or a smoke shop or a small business within the glass community and that you have a product that you want to promote or something new that you're doing, uh, this is going to be a great outlet. The podcast itself is a great outlet, but I know a lot of people are visual. Um, so the 
Wise Guy TV is going to be just another great outlet for you. Um, if you want to put together a small commercial for yourself, like any of that kind of stuff, this is going to be an outlet and a way to expose yourself. Um, with the smoke shops, I know a lot of smoke shops right now because of the COVID situation are doing virtual um, product drops basically for artists and artist shows. Uh, some smoke shops are doing them in person, just keeping them super limited, you know, that kind of stuff with masks being required to be there. The stuff that, you know, all we're all going through right now. But again, this is just something, uh, one more thing uh, for you as the listener and viewer, uh, just to get some inf other, other information outside of this podcast. Uh, also, make sure you check out last week's Wise Guy Minute episode. I covered uh, how to stay hydrated as well as how to stay cool in your studios. Talked about uh, several different types of beverages that you can make yourself with water, uh, adding different uh, fruits or vegetables to them to help with hydration. And then also other offerings outside of the spectrum of water that can help you as well. Uh, it's definitely some great information. Did a lot of research and found some really amazing scientifically proven things uh, to help you stay hydrated. I was in my studio yesterday. It was about 95, 96 degrees outside. I think the heat index was like 115. I have a little AC unit that I have in my studio that blows cooler air on me. And uh, that was reading 92 to 93 degrees all day, which is, was reading what the heat in that space was. It was hot as shit. I, by the time I was done, I went in there. I started around 11 o'clock. Uh, I was done probably about 8 last night. And by the time I was done with my evening, I was nauseous. I drank a shit ton of water and lemon water and fruit, and I had food cooled off, hosed off outside, like everything. And it was just so hot. My head was pounding. It was just ridiculous. So I uh, definitely hope that you're staying healthy out there and, and staying hydrated while you're out there in the studios because I know a lot of us right now are dealing with some severe heat. It's no fun. And one last thing, uh, i got to say thank you to some new Patreon members that we have. Uh, we've got Kyle and uh, Rashawn Jones are now both in the Patreon groups. Uh, they were, Kyle came in about two months ago, and Rashawn just came in last month. Um, I definitely appreciate you guys so much for the support in the show. Uh, but if you'd like to support this podcast, you can support it by joining our Patreon group. Uh, it's, a gr it's a small, tight-knit community that I want to grow, and I'm right now uh, this series that I'm posting for the videos, uh, for the educational stuff, and tutorials is on making birds. And the first video I did was just on the basics on how to make a small, clear bird. And uh, now I'm getting into using color just because I've been making a lot of parrots lately. And so uh, this next video that I'm actually posting tonight is uh, the whole process from start to finish on how to make a bird using color. And I'm using cadmium colors too, which are not always the easiest colors to use or the new Neo cads. Uh, you know, and I'm also using a Carlisle, which is really hard on color. So this is just a process, how to do a nice, uh, add the color to the bird, how to shape it out, how to do the feathering kind of look to the blending of the feathers and the wings on the piece. Uh, next week's series I'm going to be doing is all about making just wings themselves, how to make feathers. Uh, something I've learned just from the repetition of doing these at, over at Disney and making uh, eagles and different birds as well. Uh, making feathers is it's, it's, a, it's a fun lamp working technique in terms of sculptural that can be used for all kind of stuff. And uh, so taking this series into consideration, I'm going to be doing bird wings. So again, you can join the Patreon group. Uh, you can find us on Patreon. It's patreon.com forward slash wise guy radio. I'll have the links in the show notes for you. And uh, I appreciate everybody, Mountain Glass, the Flow Magazine, and also the Patreon folks out there. So thank you all so much for supporting this show. And I'm going to get the fuck out of here. Uh, again, if you want to support this show for free, all you need to do is help me by leaving a review on iTunes. If you have Apple Podcast app on your phone, um, if you have Stitcher or anything else out there, Spotify, iHeartRadio, I'm out there all over the place, any kind of uh, platform. Uh, also, don't forget Wise Guy TV on YouTube. You can listen to the show there as well. And any place that you listen to the show, there's some way you can leave a star review, I believe. So that helps out this show tremendously. just tells the folks out there that there's some social interaction happening with this podcast, which then helps to push it up into the ranks, exposes myself, but also exposes this community to more people out there to listen to what is going on in the world of glass. So again, thank you so much for tuning in today. Hope you enjoyed this episode 17 featuring the one and only Robert Mickelson. And you can find Robert Mickelson out there on Instagram at R-A Mickelson, R-A-M-I-C-K-E-L-S-E-N. I'll have his link in the show notes. Uh, he's showing some pretty cool stuff he's been working on. Dude is amazing. Great guy. Hope you enjoy this conversation. And until next time, have a wise day. We'll talk to you soon. Peace. Hey, Robert, welcome to the show. 
Thanks. Glad to be here. Yeah, man. It's uh, been a long time coming having you on. Uh, if you remember, but about five years ago, I think it was about 2015, you and I together did a show down, I guess it was a show, you want to call it, but a demonstration uh, down at LSD Gallery down in Fort Lauderdale. And uh, it was my first time getting to meet you in person. My biggest takeaway from that evening was this, there was a gigantic you know, Florida thunderstorm that blew through. I was making an octopus and like watching you work on one of your uh, the Glocks that you make, which was the first time you had ever added color to the Glock. And I remember you kept saying, like, I don't want to add color to these fucking things because I know what color does with clear glass, you know, in terms of shaping. But as this storm came in, I'm like watching you, you know, progress on your work. And then all of a sudden the parking lot was full of water. There's extension cords yeah. everywhere, and I'm like having an anxiety attack. Like LSD is gonna be the one studio that kills Robert Mickelson out here in the parking lot. <laughs> you know. I remember that as the first demonstration I ever did during a hurricane. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. And then we all went and got sushi and drunk afterwards, which was good. But yeah. You know? <laughs> so to get rocking and rolling, man, um, I was like this kind of you know give a basic introduction. You have a long history career as a glass artist. Um, we could spend six hours here talking about your whole career, you know, but I kind of want to hit some highlights and then kind of fast forward to where we are currently. Uh, so right. if you want to get us started uh, with how you were actually introduced to the flame and then uh, we'll go from there. All right. Well, my uh, my answer to that question and I get I get asked a lot is that I blundered into it. And the analogy is a, like a blind man in a in a dark room. <laughs> Uh, just blundered into it. I was uh, 23 years old and uh, kind of in a state of change and kind of aimless and unanchored. And I just blundered into it. I was walking through uh, a mall in Greeley, Colorado, and I saw a guy sitting in a little cubicle uh, making little doodads out of glass. And I was fascinated by the flame and the material. And I stood there and watched him for a while. And uh, it occurred to me that that looked like fun. And if he was making his living do that, I said, geez, that's better than what I'm doing. Uh, and so I talked my way through the door. The uh, company that uh, he was working for owned a little store in that mall. And uh, it was called Glass Impressions. And uh, the owner's name was Steven Seabaugh. He's the guy that taught me. I talked my way through the door, uh, convinced him that I was a top-notch salesman and would increase his sales. And then, of course, once he hired me, I showed no interest at all in selling. I only wanted to blow too funny <laughs> yeah it's interesting how you got yourself in the door like that because myself personally I, I have a similar story uh meeting gordon key who got me started at the renaissance festival i always remember as a kid seeing like you're saying the guys in the mall or whatever doing the little stuff in the holidays and then walking into this renaissance festival and seeing this big flame and this big giant dragon being created out of clear glass was just it was one of those things that just spoke to me like i got to find a way to figure this out and then after three hours of burning my eyeballs out of my head, watching him work, and he offered me an apprenticeship, you know, kind of thing. And here At I least was. he offered you. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I had to twist my uh, instructor's arms a little bit. He punished me, though. He punished me for, for misleading him. Interesting. Uh, well, he, what he did is he, he showed me how to make this little elephant. There's a little two balls and a twist and four little legs and, you know, like that. And he showed me once, and he sat on the table, and he goes, okay, make that. And that's all the instruction I got. It took me probably a week to come up with one that was even remotely comparable to his. And uh, I took it to him proudly after a week and said, look, I think I did it. And he examined it and slam dunked it into the trash can and said, okay, good. Now go make a thousand. <laughs> and so uh. that's what I did. That was my introduction. It was a thousand little elephants. That's amazing. By the time I made the thousandth one, though, I knew what I was doing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and, and do you find like that early beginnings of you know being thrown to the wolves in a sense really helped you gain an understanding for the material because you're having to figure this out on your own in a sense? It, it did. It gave me more than that. It gave me a certain confidence. I felt like you know I got no instruction. No one t showed me anything. It was all trial and error, and it took a, a, a while. It took a while, and but it, it it showed me that I had, I was genuinely interested, I was able to focus, and I was able to figure this stuff out somehow. I think I there are certain people I've always said that are, um, kind of exactly right for this for this medium and this business, 
Yeah. And what I learned, what I took away from the thousand elephants was that I was tuned for this. This was exactly right. It appealed to my sense of visual, uh, my, my sense of myself as an artist or a craftsman, at least. I didn't really know that I was an artist back then. I just, somehow it appealed to me. And I know that not everyone is like this. Not everyone is cut out for this business. Yeah. Uh, but it taught me that uh, I was, and I stuck with it ever since. It was a, it was succeeding at those thousand elephants that gave me the momentum to stick with this ever since. Because I'm really self-taught. Before your glass, did you have any kind of art at all that you did? No training. Um, I could always draw. Yeah. I mean, when, even when I was a kid, I was able to able to make little sketches and draw. And right. Draw is something I've just always been able to do. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I, when I look at it, the span of different artists out there, from new artists to older artists, and seeing artists that have been on the torch or even in, in the furnace for 20 years, and, there's, and their work still has kind of a, like a fifth grade artistic element to it, like not quite refined compared to saying like putting something of like your work next to it, who's been doing it just as long, but has like a artistic refinement to the work. Like you can hold up two different pieces. One looks like an elephant. One looks like an elephant. But yours is a fucking elephant out of Africa that looks realistic. Where the guy next to you is just like a fifth grade version of an elephant. You know what I mean? Art is about vision. Um, what I always say to people who claim they can't draw is that uh, it isn't about holding the pencil and looking at the piece of paper. It's about how you see. It's about seeing. And certain everybody sees a little differently. Yeah. Some people see the world in cartoon terms. Um, I don't. I see it in a different way. It doesn't mean one is better than the other, just that, you know, we're different. Yeah, completely. You take somebody like uh, Joey Malakias, who has, you know, a 20-year history and a highly developed skill, but that's not what makes the work extraordinary. What makes him extraordinary is his vision. He just is able to see so clearly. Doing actual portraits of people requires a certain way of looking. It isn't about the glass. It's about seeing. It's about the way you envision the world. And and that is what sets him apart from, from everyone, what makes his work so extraordinary. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's phenomenal. Absolutely. And it's I like his work, too, because you can you could pick it out of any case of anywhere you go to and know that that's his his art. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's pure Joey. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So once you got past the elephants uh, and you started moving forward, what were some of the other little tchotchkes and things you started doing? Oh, geez. Well, um, back in those days, you know, everything was, was what they called spun glass or glass weaving. Mm -hmm. There were these little loop stitch and drop stitch and California stitch and things like that that they did to make structures because that was the way that you did things. And so there was a bunch of standard pieces that um, – we made that we're selling. Um, I learned how to make little wishing wells and little bird baths and pianos and sailboats and all that nonsense. I learned how to make that stuff. I didn't particularly like it, but I liked the process. And I took pride in the neatness of my stitching and stuff. Once I got to where I could, I could do it properly. Um, it, the, the stitching makes a certain pattern. And if your pattern is real neat, it looks good. So I was taking pride in that, but I never really liked the items. They were little old lady items. Right. Um, and then one day I stumbled on a catalog for a man named Hans Frabel in Atlanta. And uh, it had magnificent sculptures, uh, beautiful, solid, you know, horses running, just, I mean, really beautiful work. And I looked at it and I thought, these are, these are beautiful. I showed it to my boss and he told me, yeah, they, he does the same thing we do. I said, what? You telling me that this guy and us, we do the same thing? What the hell are we doing? <laughs> so funny. And from that time on, I never looked at the medium the same way again. Remember, I didn't have any education or background in art or glass. Um, so I, when I left that business after my two-year you know, apprenticeship, I immediately started trying to make my own ideas, my own, they're mostly little animals, horses and unicorns and, and stuff like that, stuff that I related to, marine life, dolphins and whales and things. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found that I had to invent everything. No one could show me how to do these things because as far as I knew, they'd never been done before. That wasn't true, but that's as far as I knew. And so that's kind of how I developed my own style was in 
going out and figuring out and inventing all this stuff. Um, it was, I was terrible. <laughs> it, it took a long time. It took a long time. Yeah. Heck yeah. So at that point in time, were you living in, uh, at Florida? At, at the... Yeah. Um, yeah. I had moved to Florida in 1977. Um, you know, I often tell the story about how that decision was made. My girlfriend at the time and I, uh, <clears throat> you know, you, you, you spend about 30 seconds on a decision and it affects the entire rest of your life. Yeah. <laughs> <at that age. clears throat> she was from Florida. I was from Hawaii. We wanted to go someplace warm. We didn't like the climate of Colorado all particularly that much. And so, um, we thought about it. Like I say, we discussed it for about 30 seconds and decided it would be cheaper to go to Florida. So we did. That's what we did. We went there. <laughs> I'm still there. It's 2020, uh, uh, 45 years later, <laughs> I'm still in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. You know, it's, it's having grown up here my whole life. It's one of those states that has a little bit of everything, including it has everything <laughs> from the good and the bad. You know what I mean? And it's an interesting art market, too. You know, it's like going back to... 20 years ago where the glass scene was what it was, wasn't really much, you know, and then the Chihulis of the world started, you know, having shows here and really exploring Florida and, and exposing more people in, in this state, but also the world to the art of glass. Just understanding with my influences, with you being one of them, going back to your influences, you know, your early days um, when you met Paul Stankard and took a class from him. Well, it was more than just the class. It was the place. Penland School of Crafts is a, is a remarkable place. And they, every, uh, during a typical summer session, you have, you know, 15 different mediums and students and instructors from all those different mediums all thrown together. And then, and then you're in a community of really uh, established artists. And so we did studio tours. We did uh, all sorts of different things besides just the in-class instruction. And I realized at the time, I, it really opened my eyes to this much bigger world of glass art that I had was unknowingly a part of and that my work, you know, was seen in context of. And at the same time as it was illuminating, it was also humiliating because I realized that what I had been doing all that time, as good as I thought it was, was really pretty sophomoric and and un, undeveloped, and you know, like the work, like the work of a uneducated person. Yeah. Education is important, right? Because it informs everything that you do. And I had none. I had none. And so, at that point, I decided that you know, educating myself was probably the most important thing that uh, that uh, I could do. And I started doing that. I started reading. Uh, art books, art history, uh, learning about different styles. I started uh, just, you know, informing, going to uh, art galleries and seeing art museums and seeing work and trying to say, how do I fit in? Where does this fit in? And then my work started to change about that time. And the more I got involved in this type of learning, the more I found out that I didn't know. I, I've always said that that's really the nature of learning. It's like walking into this big room. The further into the room you get, the bigger the room gets. Yeah. You never get far past the entrance. So it's uh, it's an ongoing education. For me, here I am, 45 years in, 46 years in. I'm 68 years old, and I'm still a beginner. I'm still just learning. There's so much to learn. It'll never end. I always want to be a student. And the beginning, the beginning of it, though, the beginning of really opening my eyes and seeing, seeing that was in 1980. I forget 87, 89. What did I? I don't. Know, I forget what I wrote on my little. Yeah, you, there, you, wrote, but, you wrote 89. All right. Well, whenever that class was, yeah, <laughs> all, that's the one that really, really did it. And I credit Paul because um, Paul, Paul's a great artist. But, uh, you know, we all went up there. <laughs> we thought we were going to learn how to do uh, encased flower paperweights, right? And Paul had very little interest in teaching us that. What he wanted to do was hold poetry readings, and go on nature walks, and studio visits, and have discussions on aesthetics. And we were like, what the hell? What are you doing the money for this shit? But, you're, you know, later on, I realized that that's the important stuff. Completely <laughs> agree. Paul had it right. Yeah. Any damn fool can show you how to encase a floral paperweight. It's not that hard. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> a little philosophy into the reason why we do what we do. 
Well, the, but like I say, it's the vision, it's that philosophy that's important. And that's what sets each of us apart. And that's the part that's for, for a great many people. That's the part that's underdeveloped because they haven't invested there either. Haven't been doing it long enough or they haven't expanded their view to be broad enough to really understand that that's the important part. And that's the part where that, that's the part that will keep you humble. That's the reason that a lot of those glass blowers look down on us because they, most of them come through college. They encounter glass, not randomly like you and I did. They go to college and they take a class and yeah. they learn art along with their craft. Right. And so they come at it from a much more informed uh, standpoint. And when they see us and we're just out there hacking away, making little doodads, you know, pipes included, uh, we've caught up. It isn't like that anymore. And everywhere that I go where I encounter glass blowers, they have respect for flame workers. They do now. Yeah. It's not the way it used to be. We used to be the redheaded stepchild of the glass world, but mm -hmm. not so much anymore. Now we're, I think we're respected. And a lot of that is due to the success. There's no glass art trade anywhere that comes close to pipe making as far as broad scale success is concerned. We rock. <laughs> you know, so after you took these classes, like, did you, did you guys actually do it in a case paperweight in that class? Uh, Paul did. Yeah. A, a simple one, but he, he mostly taught us how to make beads. Interesting. <laughs> I said, I had no interest in making beads and I resisted it. I didn't want to do it. And then finally toward the end of the class, I tried it and I thought, Ooh, this is actually cool. This is fun. <laughs> what Paul recognized that we did it was that we lacked the skill. We just did. So what's the point in teaching these guys to do something they're not even remotely qualified to even try? So he taught us how to make these little wound beads on mandrels. And I went home learning, having learned how to do that. And I immediately bought some soft glass and pulled down some cane and got myself some mandrels and started making real simple beads just for fun. I didn't have any intention of selling them. And I'd been doing it about, uh, oh, I don't know, two months when I got a visit from my old friend, Lewis Wilson. Oh, God, this is, this is so long ago. Lewis came to visit me in my, in my home in Melbourne Beach. And I said, Lewis, Lewis, look what I learned up in Penland. And I showed him how to make a beat. I swear, one month later, Lewis came out with his first how to make a bead video. One month <laughs> later. <laughs> I get credit for unleashing Lewis Wilson in the, on the bead world. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I had uh, I had Lewis on the show about two years ago. He was in my top five artists. He was like my number two under you. So when I was talking to him about things, um, he had brought up that the two of you guys knew each other and had actually uh, worked within the same realm of space in St. Pete at the Wagon Wheel Flea Market. True. And we were rivals at the Wagon Wheel Flea Market. <laughs> yeah, totally. And I, rem I was a kid. I grew up in – I'm from St. Pete. So having visited the flea market, I remember as a young lad in the early 80s, maybe, you know, late 70s, um, seeing guys that were there selling these little tchotchkes, little trinkets and little glass figures and stuff, you know, and that would have been me and Lewis. <laughs> yeah. And it was so funny, man, talking to him because I, I remember as a, I remember having visions of, of seeing glass blowers. I remember going to Bush Gardens and seeing artists there doing like giraffes and stuff. But uh -huh. before that, I remember the flea market and I couldn't remember, I couldn't place where it was. And then he said that shit. And I was like, oh, my God, this is so funny. Like just like this circle of where I am. And now like St. Pete's like this little small mecca for glass blowing, you know, with the gas. Oh, yeah. Having been there. St. Pete has no bears, no resemblance at all to the St. Pete that I knew when I lived there. When I lived there, it was a retirement home. It was known for having all very old people. Yep. Now it's happened is all those old people are gone. Yep. <laughs> And it's been replaced by this vibrant young community of artists, and especially in that area around uh, Duncan and uh, Dave and Josh's studio and all that. And uh, there's a number of other people who are who are there now as well. And it is just a remarkable place. It's probably the epicenter of Florida for uh, for glass and for other art as well. It's a it's a great place. Yeah, I completely agree. Um... Were you were you living over in Melbourne at that same time? Were you going back and forth or? Uh, no, I actually I only lived in St. Pete for a few years. Um, I moved there in 1977 and I moved to Melbourne in 1980. So only three years. Okay. I lived in St. Pete. I lived in Gulfport. 
That's okay. Sad. Hey, me but too. I That's where I was. Yeah, I, was, I lived over by Stetson University. Yeah, grew up right over there. It's so funny. Small world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> So at that point in time, uh, so you're in, you're in Melbourne doing your stuff in the studio, and I remember over the years seeing you expanding, you know, and, and bringing in new kilns and bringing lathes in, you know, through social media. This is up, you know, fast forward to social media stuff. Um, but but that got me to then at that point in time to then go back into your history, and I remember reading an article where how you had talked about William Morris as an influence. Then reading your bio, so the name comes up again. And working within the Chihuly collection, it's a familiar name to me as well, as he had been a designer in a sense and one of Chihuly's right-hand man. Um, when you went to Pilchuck and taught classes in the 90s, before, was it were they there at that point in time or was that before then when you taught there? Um, the very first teaching experience I had was Pilchuck in 1994. I always said I started at the top and worked my way down. Um, <laughs> It uh, the they always have two what they call gappers, sort of uh, hired gun glass blowers to work in the hot shop and make things for people, for especially for the instructors. It's one of the perks you get is you get two four hour blow slots with the gaffers for them to make you whatever you want as a perk of instruction. And the gaffers for that first session were Dante Marioni and Billy Morris, two of the very finest glass blowers in the world. Yeah. And uh, if you can imagine how intimidating that was to have you know, me, a lowly flame worker, <laughs> with Dante and Billy at my disposal, it was uh, quite the experience. Um, but um, that, that's a long, there's a lot of long and funny stories about all that that I don't want to really take up our time with. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. But the takeaway was is that I saw these amazing craftsmen and artists and was very influenced at how highly developed their craft was. And I decided, even though I was an instructor there, that development was what I needed. And also clear and creative thinking. I needed to think out of the box that, you know, the, the things that I was making up until that point were sort of starting to emerge and, and, and become something different, but I needed to blow away everything that I, all the preconceptions that I had and start completely new. And what came out of that very first class were the first sculptural goblets that I did, where I just really pulled out the stops. I, I, I stopped thinking in terms of the amount of time something took versus the amount of money I could get for it and marketing in that way. I started thinking that there was no upper limit, none whatsoever. All I had to do was make a masterpiece. And then every piece had to be a masterpiece. And I started you know, with that, with that mindset. And um, it, it, at the time, you have to remember when this was, this was the mid to late 90s. And there was an economic boom about that time. Yeah. I rode that economic boom from the middle 90s all the way to when it ended around 2000. I guess 2001. I guess 9-11 was really the official end, but the, the, the dot-com bubble had burst by 2000. So for those you know five or six years, I rode that, and it allowed me to develop the work because it would sell. <laughs> it kept me alive. Yeah. I was rewarded financially. And, uh, you know, with, with uh, shows and uh, exhibitions and galleries at SOFA uh, for that. And so you saw the work really blossom. Um, I've always said that no one learns more than the teacher. <laughs> Boy, that's always been true for me. Every time I go teach something, no one comes away learning more than me. <laughs> so funny. I completely agree. I understand that what you're saying there. Well, so anyway... That's how all that came about. Uh, the, the, the two classes that I taught in 94 and 95 at Pilchuck were hugely influential. You can see the before and the after um, of that period. It was, it's, really, it's really quite remarkable. Yeah, I can't imagine just, just to soak up the energy. But did, at that point in time, too, did you get a chance to do any furnace work at all? Like, Were you doing hot shop stuff or was it mostly just offline? I played around a little bit with furnace work, and I actually took two classes at uh, the Corning Museum studio uh, with Bill Gudenroth. They were introductory Venetian techniques and had an absolute ball. I, I, I really learned about the material. Um, I learned to, I learned that by the end of the one week class, I could make a three part goblet, foot, stem, and bowl. And I, you know, it was there ugly, but I could make them. Yeah. Uh, but I had a great time 
and learned a lot about material and, and developed techniques, you know, that I then translated to my flame working. But the most important thing I learned was, is that I like flame working better. That was important. You know, I didn't want to come away thinking, oh, geez, I wish I did this instead of that. Right. Uh, instead, I thought I'm actually pretty happy as a flame worker. I, flame working allows me to do things that can't be done that way. And that's really what I was interested in. Yeah, I'm glad you say that because so for myself, I, I've dabbled before working at Disney in, in the hot shop, mostly just the same kind of thing. Like I taught classes for lamp working and then the trade was some free hot shop time as an assistant. And uh, once I got into Disney, we have a hot shop in, at our shop in Magic Kingdom. And I got a chance to go back there and assist, which then turned into me being back there full time for like two years. And we're doing production ornaments and just whatever we were cranking out. But the same thing, it, it gave me an appreciation and an understanding for the glass. Totally different type of glass process, different tools, different everything. But I was finding I was I'd get into a point to where I would fuck something up, pop the bottom out of a, a pumpkin, trying to blow into the mold. And like seeing the guys working, they would take their diamond shears and just cut the bottom off and then cut it and reheat it and, you know, reshape the pumpkin out where I'm, I got into those situations where I'm like, OK, if I was on the torch, how would I handle this? So I'd go to the marble table and try to marble it down. And I was finding success with the mindset of a flame worker going into the hot shop with still with limitations. You know what I mean? And then once I got out of the hot shop and back on the torch, same thing with me. I realized, like, I love the flame at the torch way better than the hot shop. The hot shop's a blast. It's a different energy. And, uh, but the handsets and the skills I learned, not only with the understanding of the material, but also the hand skills of the, the rolling the pipes and just different things I wasn't used to doing. I then translated to the torch using jacks, you know, that kind of stuff. And yeah, uh, I, I had a similar experience, you know, uh, I think all knowledge contributes to, yeah. to what you do. And, uh, I, I learned basically that, the most important thing I think is I learned to marble correctly. Yeah. Um, marbling was a skill, and I still marble with this two-handed style on too. my on a big plate because <laughs> that's the way that I feel the glass the best. And yeah. I learned that, you know, from Bill Goodenrough. People see me marble that way, and they go, "Oh, have you been in the hot shop?" I said, "Well, you know, a little." <laughs> Pretty funny. Yeah. So, well, I, I feel like uh, I feel like the I just there's so much to learn. I, yeah, I was gonna. Anyway, that's good. <laughs> that's why I, I t people always ask me, "Don't you get bored?" Because I make, you know, with that Disney, it's, it's still production work, and I'm making the same shit over and over again. And they're like, "Don't you get bored from this?" I'm like, "No, man, because the piece I just made, this next one, my goal is to make it better than that one, and that'll be that way for the next hundred years until God bless. I can't, you know, my day I'm no longer here doing this. It's just the, yeah. the constant strive to be better, you know, what we do. Um, so, so I guess getting into your bigger pieces, because you know, in the hot shop. The scale is limited by technology and their equipment. We're very similar, and as the scale began to grow within the pipe world, to kind of to back up before you got into the pipes, you know, seeing the scale of the stuff you're doing with when you got into the network type stuff you were making, what was the initial, I guess, influence and inspiration into going really big on pieces, but in a whole different, not in a solid form, you know, but in that network type type of style? Well, I have to give credit to a man named Brent Key Young, who. Um, influenced me seeing his work influenced me i thought hey you know that's something interesting brent specializes in mostly geometric style sculptures and uh very large pieces and i thought it would be interesting to take a different tack on it using the technique um i mean i could go on and on all day about uh about bending and welding small diameter glass rods mm -hmm. who invented it uh, Anna Skipska basically gets gets credit for being the first to really really explore this and, but she did it differently everybody does it differently um, but for me I immediately thought that uh, I wanted to try to do more organic forms um, and my approach was much more about the skin uh, where Brent does a lot of work with pieces in shapes inside of shapes inside of shapes and so that you get this effect of the shape superimposed because you can see through it um, I'm more interested in the skin I want to make forms and so my pieces um, the challenge was to make a sculptural form like a torso or a horse's head or the umbrella mm -hmm. um, out of this network out of this networking technique and and that's the direction that I took it kind of sets my work apart from uh, from what other people have done using this technique. Um, I really enjoy it. 
It's meditative. It's very, very, very slow. It takes weeks to make something. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> it's, uh, and you have to, so you have to get a very high dollar price, you know, to, to pay for your time. But again, by discarding any concern for that, it sort of opened me up and enabled me to make um, these remarkable things. And I've sold a fair number of them. I own also a fair number of them. Uh, but uh, it doesn't mean that I you know, regret making them or anything like that. I still think that it's a wonderful way to work. And I've always said that once I'm so old and decrepit that I, that I can't no longer sit at the torch and blow glass, I'll still be able to do that. <laughs> Which makes perfect sense. <clears throat> it, something I've always found too with with your work is you have a very elegant kind of sexiness to it, like a like a, the female shape. And what I remember seeing, like you're talking about the female shape doing the network, uh, like a torso that you did, I believe it was a female. Yeah, well, I've spent my whole life, st life studying them. Yeah, know, so. exactly. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> the biggest influence we have, right? And motivator, I guess. Yeah. In life. <laughs> but uh, you know, seeing your form, you know, and and then also your figures that you create too. And uh, it's, it's something I've always strived to, to, the female form is very specific, you know, in terms of the look, but we all have our styles and what we go for. Um, so it was fun to see you take, like they're saying, like the skin aspect of it, like you're just kind of cr almost creating like a three-dimensional silhouette of a, of a piece, you know, and, it, and that's got to be really tricky to look at something from all sides and it be proportionally correct, you know, not only proportionally, but also in that scale. So when you're when you're visualizing that kind of thing, are you? Because I've heard that you create blueprints, and I know myself. I I also draw things on paper. So when you're doing that, are you actually creating like a physical grid on paper that's to scale of what it is you're creating? So you have a guide, like a jig, in a sense. Um, not quite. Uh, to design, I use a program called Poser. Okay. Poser is a three-dimensional human figure posing program you're given a human figure and you can get little you can drag the elbows and the legs and the torso and you can do twists and you can pose the figure any way you want and then what you have is a three-dimensional representation that you can spin around in circles and so i it design poses in poser that until i like one and then what i'll do is is spin it around and take pictures of it at the different angles and I'll take two or possibly three of the, the most important angles and I will blow them up to life size. And uh, using Photoshop, I will print them out over multiple pieces of paper, you know, and then tape the pieces of paper together. And that gives me a life size template to build the framework, like the profile or the sides. There's sort of like four, you know, sort of 12 o'clock, uh, three o'clock, six o'clock, nine o'clock for yeah, the each various planes. individual part yeah. that has a contour and that enables me to get a framework done. And then from there, I fill in and go and go from there. And it does enable me by using that as a template, enables me to keep my proportion straight. Now that said, lots of stuff happens in the process. Yeah. <laughs> And you end up abandoning the template after a while and, and using your artistic sense in order to construct and modify as, as you go. It's, uh, it, it all comes down to visualization. And I find myself, you know, many times having to stand back from the work and walk around it, you know, and look at it from different angles to try to figure out something's wrong, but I don't know what it is. Okay, uh, that's it. I got to change that. And, That's uh, but I go. I, I it's it's most compelling. The the pieces, especially when they're human figures, are most compelling when I nail the proportions correctly because that's what people respond to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, completely. It's, it's it's like trying to uh, make a face in glass. I mean, really make a face in general. Everybody knows what the human face looks like proportion wise, and if the eyes are a little out of place, or a little too big, or the nose is too, you know everything's the human brain recognizes that just naturally. So I, yeah, you they, know. Do it, they do it so naturally, in fact, that I differ with your opinion. I think most people don't know what a face looks like. They really have no idea. They, they can look at a face and they recognize it. But the minute they're confronted with a white sheet of paper and a pencil and try to reproduce a face, right. they resort to their four-year-old person's version of what a face, and they draw little almonds for eyes and a little point for nose and a little line for the mouth, and that's it, because that's their understanding. They really don't know. And it 
takes a while to train yourself to get to the point where Joey Malachias is. You have to be able to identify everything about it in the most subtle way to do caricatures of faces. I mean, the difference between uh, two people, actual people, the differences are so subtle that it's very difficult to represent in a medium that's as challenging as glasses. And yet Joey nails it. He nails it so well that there's no mistaking it. And that, that's just how clear a vision he has. And I would say that there is almost no one in this business besides him that sees it that clearly, that has that clear of an understanding of it. I wish I did. I'm, I'm trying, but I, <laughs> I cannot come close to Joe. Aren't we all? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I, it makes sense what you're saying, because I know I remember seeing a study one time where they, they uh, gave people paper and asked them to draw a bicycle. And we've all rode bicycles, you know, and we all know how they work mechanically wise, but to actually physically draw the handlebars and the wheels and where the chain goes and the, mm-hmm. you know, all that stuff, it's a, a very similar thing. Yeah. It's, right. It's, draw it from memory and you go back to, you you know, your four year old version of, yeah. of what it is. It's uh, there, like I say, drawing is a way of looking. You learn to see a certain way. And the people who have um, always, they say, I've always been able to draw even when they were kids see that way naturally Mm -hmm. other people they don't see that way naturally but they can be taught and i was kind of a combination i could i was confident enough to try to draw when i was a kid but i learned as i went how to look at things and like an artist does so that i could then reproduce them in the way that uh, i want i'm still learning it's still very challenging every day i I am faced with this whenever I'm making things yeah. um, that are new that I've never made before. I have to figure that part of it out. I, I have an introduction into, into sculpture class that I teach. It's a, and it's a six-week class, and it's all basic animals. But I do like a lecture and lab portion, and the lecture aspect of it is how to draw that particular sh- animal that you're making using basic shapes. You know, We're taught to draw a cat using triangle shapes you know, and things like that. Because I know, mm-hmm. like you're saying, like a lot of artists – don't have the skill set to draw or then if they do it's hard for them to get out of their head on a paper what it is that they see in their you know in their brain so by starting off with shapes you can eventually take those shapes and make them form into whatever you're going for and then you can translate that into glass by making the shapes in glass and then you know similar right. kind of well, thing you're solving the same problem it's yeah. the same problem whether you're solving it on paper or with glass or with clay or with wood or whatever you're solving the same problem yeah there's just different mediums in which to solve that same problem so drawing is relatively inexpensive and fast compared to glass yeah. <laughs> so it's good to draw things first because you can learn from your drawing and your attempt at drawing stuff that would be far more difficult and expensive to try to learn just using the material <laughs> yeah completely agree and that's why i preach a lot too for artists to go into do a clear sketch in glass first not just go rush into the color because it's oh, you know, we know, yeah, you know right. color color is expensive and every color works differently. So you may have an idea of how it's going to work, but you add color to it, as you know, and it just makes everything go from left to ten right. Ten times harder. <laughs> yeah, yes. it's so tricky. It's ten times harder and ten times more expensive. <laughs> yeah, completely. So uh, 2008 happens, the house bubble pops as well, and the whole market goes to shit. And you know, a lot of us artists out there, a lot of I mean, people in general were struggling. You know, people weren't spending money. You know, it was a shit time out there just in this country. And the pipe game, though, was still going pretty solid, you know, going through that. And uh, it's true. It's true. It was those were really rough times. And um, I had uh, I didn't really have a way anywhere to turn. Um, it's not like I burned all my bridges, but. Up until that time, I, my career had sort of consisted of these 10-year periods. I did 10 years on the street, 10 years in the wholesale shows, 10 years selling exclusively through galleries. And when that ended, that was it. That's, that's the whole market. There was nothing else. And I had run through them all, and there wasn't anything to, to turn to. And I found myself like in this limbo where instead of making more work, I was getting work back because the galleries were closing and sending all my work back to oh, me. Man, that's the worst. You know? Yeah. And it was like, oh, why should I make more? I can't sell the things that I have. And it was, there was no ready market. And I struggled. I relied on teaching. Uh, my strategy at the time, I describe it as uh, my amphibian strategy where I bury up in the mud and wait for the next rain. I just got, I got small. I didn't, I, uh, 
didn't have any employees. I tried to reduce my expenses and still my income dwindled and dwindled and dwindled and dwindled until I thought, boy, I could be looking at the end of my career here because there was nowhere to turn and there was no end in sight that the, 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 the crash happened suddenly and the recovery happened very, very slowly. Yeah. For most arts and crafts, we're the first to feel it and the last the first to feel the downfall and the last to feel the recovery. So I was really between a rock and a hard place at that time. It was tough. Yeah. I can't imagine. I know. Uh, yeah. It was, you know, it was such a weird time for a, like, even like a lot of friends of mine that were in real estate that lost everything. You know? Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it was just, horrible. it's just incredible. So then uh, event a couple of years, I guess after that degenerate art comes out. And uh, Slinger does the documentary on the pipe culture and really introduced a whole new generation to glass blowers. I kind of, I kind of like you talking about the phases of glass in your life. I look at like the pipe industry. There was the beginning five to six years ish, um, and then Dustin Revere started doing a lot of online YouTube stuff, and a lot of people saw his artists saw his work or glass blowers. Um, and excellent quite, videos, by the way. I'm on, I want to yeah. give kudos to Dustin for excellent instructional videos. I have watched them and learned from them myself. Yeah, me too. And because, but because of that, there was a whole generation uh, that I refer to as like the Revere generation, where that learned through trial and error at home by watching his videos and stuff. And then Degenerate Art came out, which then spawned a whole new interest into the pipe industry. And a lot of people also were exposed to you as you've had a little cameo in there. And, a little. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and what I, what, I, what I was, I remember seeing that and the, the one comment, which it could be controversy, it could be whatever, that I, I've, I've been wanting to ask you forever was when you made the reference of pushing that damn bowl into the pipe. And, you know, I know you always, you always had an appreciation for the pipe industry as the glass art, just, you know, glass artists in general, but it was kind of like, you kind of broke the internet, quote unquote, you know, with that comment. And a lot of people, some people have had negative opinions about it and some people had positive opinions about it. Myself personally, Absolutely. I had a huge positive opinion about it because Robert Mickelson now is in the pipe game. You know, you're involved in this, in this industry, you're an outsider coming in, in a sense, you know, this, this, uh, you know. Let me talk about Degenerate Art. Yeah, yeah, please. No, please do. It, it's, it's a very important uh, film. Um, you know, the interview where I made that comment happened in 2005. The movie came out in 2013. That's eight years later. Interesting. I had, so the, it was so a funny. long, slow process. Yeah. Now, in 2005, I was still selling through galleries and doing teaching and, and still feeling like, you know, my place was fairly secure in the glass blowing world. And that, uh, my, I've always had a positive attitude towards the Pipers. I've always thought they were a remarkable bunch and I've always been encouraging towards them. I have never condemned them or said, you shouldn't make pipes. There's, you know, I, I know I get lumped in with some other people whose names I won't mention who actually did condemn pipe makers. But uh, that never really happened for me. And I stand by my comment in that movie because it's a legitimate question. Mm -hmm. Agreed. The, the question is this. If it's art, why does it have to have a bowl in it? If it's art, why do you have to push a bowl in it? Now, Slinger, was a, a, he's a really smart dude. And he was clever enough to edit that movie so that two scenes after I asked that question, we get an answer. We get an answer from Jason Lee, who eloquently answers my question. I mean, it's perfect the way Slinger did it. And to this day, I am proud of my role. Um, I ask the question. It's a difficult question. And yes, it pisses people off. Good. Good. Exactly. People should be challenged. And I asked it from an innocent standpoint. I wanted to know. Because I had just seen Banjo and, and a, a, a bunch of other really great glass blowers. I forget there who else was there. Just some terrific people uh, build this magnificent, huge, black sculptural piece. Just a really remarkable, ambitious work of art. But it was a pipe, and I wanted to know if it can stand on its own. You know, as a sculpture, why does it have to be a pipe? But like I say, Jason Lee answers that question. And then anybody, they all remember what I say, but I don't think that many people remember Jason's answer. You should yeah. go back, watch the movie again and listen to Jason yeah. because Jason's got the answer. 
And that's what I always tell people. If you just saw what I, if you just saw me and you didn't listen to Jason, you don't remember that, then you didn't really watch the movie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the, 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 the scene immediately following Jason giving my answer, there's me and Banjo collaborating on a fight. Yep. You know, in the movie, it goes bang, bang, bang. What people don't realize is that represents a span of eight years. Fascinating. Movie magic. <laughs> well, yeah, it is. It's movie magic. And uh, yeah, I, anyway, degenerate yeah. art was a great thing. And uh, I, kudos to uh, Slinger for for making a really seminal film about our industry. I still get fired up when I watch it. Like if I if I am feeling like I don't want to go blow some glass, I could put that film on. And before right before the end of that movie gets over, I'm literally off the couch, standing up, like looking at the TV screen, just because it just I have such a passion for the glass, but also for the pipe industry itself. Like I love the ceremonial aspect of it, the underground, uh, you know, side of it. What we've all gone through as uh, Operation Pipe Dreams happened, and we all had to go back underground again, and the the survivalness of it, and then you look at art in the world and like you said earlier, like in terms of a community, I don't know of any other art community that's ever existed. Like the pipe industry and the pipe community that we have, not only like the type of people that are in it, the, 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 just the diversity of human beings that are in the pipe industry, uh, but also the love for each other. There are some glass holes everywhere you go, you know, as, as we all know, there, there's, there's some assholes out there in the industry and egos and what have you. But, it's just fascinating to see the technology that's that's grown in the borosilicate world being pushed by the pipe industry and the color palette we have you know I'll all be, of that is driven by the success of the pipe industry it yeah. takes money to develop things like that the tools um, the skills the, the materials are all in, in an absolutely remarkable place um, I was working with some uh, North Star cherry uh, just yesterday in fact and it is just such an amazing material. It is this beautiful, vibrant red that if you put the right flame on it, it doesn't bubble. Mm -hmm. It is just absolutely great. And I thought to myself, man, I tell you what, if my old teacher, Stephen Seabock, could see this material, <laughs> he would just be a guy. Yeah, he would be astonished at, at, at this stuff yeah, because it didn't exist only 20 years ago. It simply didn't exist. <clears throat> um, so it's all been developed as, as a response to this huge demand. And right now, the demand is still really amazing. Uh, good luck try, right now trying to buy any of Multanora's products. Yeah, tell me about good it. Good luck trying <laughs> to buy the more popular glass alchemy uh, colors right now because they you can't get them. They are just in such high demand. They all get snapped up the minute they hit the market. And that's going to lead to even you know more innovations. Yeah, I agree, hundred um, percent. And it's listen. I want to say something else right here too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, before we get any further, um, I want to ex express. Uh, I've done this before, but I want to express my gratitude to the general pipe community for accepting me and my participation. Um, I uh, I will always be grateful. I'll always stand up for the pipers. I will always try to give as much as I, you know, receive from this industry. And uh, I just want to, you know, again, say that I'm very, very grateful, especially to the people who had introduced me to this business, um, Kevin Ivey in particular, and Salt, that dragged me kicking and screaming <laughs> into the, onto the dark side. And uh, I'll, I'll always be here. I'll, you know, I'm going to be on this and doing this uh, for good. I'm, this is a uh, this is my work now, and uh, it's going to stay this way. So thank you all. Thank uh, you. <laughs> yeah, brought a slight tear to my eye, man, because I, I again, you know, I've followed your work for as long as I have, and the, and the influence you've had on my work as as a fine artist in this medium, and then seeing that your work now as a pipe maker, it's it's incredible what you're making. So well, I'm a far <laughs> better glass blower than I was, you know, seven or eight years ago. Far better. I've learned so much. Um, I feel like I've you know, it's been a fair exchange. I've brought some things to the table as well that I've been able to teach people and influence people. But boy, have I learned the skills. Um, you know, back uh, when I did that class with Kevin and uh, Kevin Ivy down in Austin, um, I couldn't even push a bowl. Didn't even know how to do that. Um, I made a, 
a demonstration piece. It was a wasp and somebody suggested I push a bowl in it. I said, I'm sorry. I don't know how I had to hand it off to Kevin to do the bowl. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So now here I'm, I'm making recyclers and all this stuff. <laughs> I've had to learn all these skills. I bought two lathes. You know, my skill sets are just exponentially more than they were uh, just a few years ago. And uh, that's been very rewarding. I love my tool set. <laughs> Hell yeah, yeah, man. It's it's uh, it's it's been interesting watching the evolution of of the of the pipe industry, especially over like the last ten years. Like the the art that was being paid for hundreds of thousands of dollars for pipes people were making, and then it's gone down a little bit. And you know, as any business, there's roller coasters, ebbs and flows and in the industries. And our industry has been kind of based on laws changing within the cannabis industry. Um, also like the spice was around for a while, which helped it, as much as I hated that stuff and it was making people sick. It also gave smoke shops the ability financially to then spend money on higher end glass pieces, which then, you know, we can't really started that whole, that whole thing there. Um, and then when, when you, you're coming into this industry, there's, it's established in a sense at that point in time, you know, there was this really high peak of, of work that, and quality that was being created. I mean, I still say the pipe maker to me is the most technologically advanced artist out there with the stuff that's being created. So that being said with the, to the technology and the intricacies, you know, the Jesus seals and all these recyclers and things that are being developed and a lot of scientific applications that are coming into the pipe world as the concentrates came into the cannabis industry. What kind of back up to that? What was some of the very first influence in pipes that you started to make in terms of fun your functional work? Um, well, the very first pipes that I made, there were two types. The first one was I took some old pieces of mine and uh, basically added plumbing. <laughs> they were huge. I think one was 42 inches tall. <laughs> they were gigantic things. They were my sculptures, you know, yeah. and I just made them so that you could smoke out of them. And those were the first ones. And then I started making the guns. The guns really sort of introduced me to this. It's really funny. The very first one I ever made <laughs> was an AK-47. And I, you know, not knowing anything about, uh, you know, pipes and how they work or anything, I basically uh, made it a giant water pipe bubbler but decided it would be very clever to add a carburetor like you would in a, in a spoon and make it work with the trigger so you would pull the trigger to carburate as if a bubble bubbler needed carburation so funny <laughs> it was so funny and of course by the time i built the whole thing it didn't work at all i mean total functional failure yeah but the guy bought it didn't care he just he just wanted the gun so fortunately for me you know it sold and the guy who bought it uh, didn't care <laughs> yeah, that's all that matters but uh i i remember um being the very first show i ever did was a big show in uh, las vegas and i was right across from ham who's an absolute master yeah master. he's a monster yeah he is just amazing i was right across from him and i remember he would come over and look at my work and go well you haven't pushed many balls have you Mickelson? <laughs> <laughs> I say no. I, to be honest, I'm a habit. <laughs> That's so funny. Oh God, it's classic. I know. And then, of course, you know, the irony was that it wasn't a good show for him, and I sold out. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> oh, that's too good. Oh, that was horrible. Yeah, Ham, fantastic guy. I I've learned a lot from him. Um, he's a great designer. And uh, no, he's not just a great glass boy, he's also a great designer and, uh, and an artist and uh, just one of the very, very best flame workers on the planet. Yeah, guys, pushing yeah. it all the time. Yeah. Heck yeah. So, so the weapons of glass, it was, I, I remember talking with you about it down in LSD and you, know, you're, you have a, a love for guns and that kind of stuff. But, uh, well, well, I do not well, have a love for guns. Well, I actually we, don't like guns. Right. So that's what I was going to get into. So I remember we talked about, because I had asked you about that, and you said yeah. that it was the idea of it being a functional ceremonial piece, in a sense, as a weapons of peace, as you know, in terms of the industry versus a weapon being used for war. And, yeah. a, and a lot of people that, that saw you first making all these guns assumed that you had this love for going out and shooting guns and you know, blah, blah, blah. So it was kind of this contradicting perspectives on your work because of how realistic they are you know like you see these pieces and they're like detail you could hold up a gun next to it that's the same type of model and they're almost you know to it's yeah. incredible well what i um what started it was just 
I was moving out to, into the country. I moved from uh, Melbourne up into Mims, Florida, which is a very rural area. And I'm what the, I immediately learned that almost every single person that I met was a gun owner. Everybody in, in rural America, that is just like a fact. Everybody has guns. And I started wondering what the deal was because these weren't weird people. These weren't, you know, this wasn't the stereotypical. Um, you know, hillbilly gun owner or anything like that. These were normal people and they all had guns. And so I started wondering what it was about guns. And then what that caused me is to start looking at them. And even though I don't own guns and don't particularly like guns, I noticed that they had a certain aesthetic about them. It was an architectural aesthetic, sort of like buildings or maybe cars would be a closer comparison. Mm -hmm. There's design that goes into them. There are features of those guns, the lines, the proportions. It's not purely about function. The guns that are purely about function are very plain and frankly quite ugly. So I got interested in the ones with the beautiful curves and why are guns designed like this? And it occurred to me that, that if you took the aesthetic and built a piece that contained the aesthetic but not the lethal part of it, that that would say something about the human condition. Um, I believe that I believe that art and war are two sides of the of the human coin. You can't have one without the other. They're two sides of a coin. They're inseparable. And so my idea about making these guns was to illustrate that. And what I wanted to do was to see how people responded. You know, from all across the uh, the spectrum of uh, gun debate and it was pretty much as i expected i had an experience early on where i made a very large uh, japanese machine gun the damn thing was 52 inches long wow. as realistic as i could make it um and sitting in an art gallery and and uh i chanced upon two people talking about it one of them was a gun freak and the other one was a was a anti-gun person and they were both discussing this piece together and I, and I listened in on the conversation and I thought to myself, well, that's success because these two people would have nothing whatsoever to talk about if they didn't talk about this. <laughs> that's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty interesting. And, you know, also I, it, it was also, it's also been a very successful series, which, you know, successful financial affirmation always, you know, encourages you to do more. And so I've done more. Um, a lot of other people have sort of come and worked with me. Uh, some of the most interesting collaborations that I've done have been, you know, guns bringing in different aspects. And so people have enthusiastically embraced this Weapons of Peace series. And um, I would say that at this standpoint, I've made something like 40 uh, guns. And uh, I, I think it's probably the most important series of my career. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's uh, it's influential in all kind of senses, like you're saying, and and I I love the intricacies of of like the seeing the individual bullets in a clip, or you know this the different the details that you had had added to these, and then along with the collaborations, the details within the collaborations, like I think that type of collaboration to me is is what the collaboration's about, where you can have a specific style that you create that you're known for another artist can come in with their pattern, their look, the two merge. And then you have this new entity. That's, you know, a, a pure form of collaboration. Yeah. And in uh, the beginning, in the beginning, the weapons grew out of my networking phase because I learned that I could solve problems through networking, any problem. It didn't really matter what it was. I could represent it by, you know, through basically networking. And as the guns progressed, as I got better and better at them, I represented fewer and fewer parts with networking. But the one part that remained was the magazine. Um, early on, people thought it was so cool that the bullets, were, you could see the bullets in the magazine and that they were loose. They would rattle around in there. Yeah. And so even in the guns that are no networking at all, the entire gun is made of, you know, blown parts. Uh, the, the, the magazine remains networked so that you can see the bullets. It's a great idea. And that's something that's always intrigued me about them too, is that you can create a square shape because we all know in glass creating oh, these yeah. hard edges is a pain in the ass. If not almost impossible, it's obviously not impossible, but you know, it's uh yeah, 
you know. glass doesn't want to be square it wants to be round yeah completely. <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah and going back to the you know to the lsd de- demonstration uh show when you were making that glock and then i remember you're 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 starting to add the color to the handle and i hear fuck this is why i don't like using color in these goddamn things right and i look over at you and you're like soaking wet and like again that's when i walked over and was like wanting to see what was going on and then also make sure you weren't going to die out in the parking lot from electrical you know stuff happening but uh and then you fast forward to now and you see the vibrancies and the colors that you're that you're incorporating now in these pieces and as we said earlier you know every color is different you know so was there a point in time where you you got the okay let's go ahead and add color to these things and then, you know, yeah, I just got I just got more and more confident with the form. But now let's let's be sure, let's be clear about this. Um, that fuck moment where I went fuck still happens almost daily. Yeah, <laughs> you just don't see it. It's not you know I'm not doing it in front of people. <laughs> yeah, it's completely. This is an unforgiving medium. It is really, and and you push it to the extent that uh, that uh, we push it. You're gonna get that all the time. The glass is gonna fight back. Yeah, and absolutely. It yeah, it reminds me of uh, you came in. There, there was some kind of show going on in St. Pete that you came in for. I don't. I think it was maybe an opening at Duncan's place. But I remember you came to Zen and uh, on a Thursday night for one of their open studio jams, and you made a female figure in all black glass, and uh, it was a blown glass figure. You kind of showing us how the tubulation, which is I learned that term from you, going you know adding turning something solid into a hollow form, and you got right to the very end of this female. It was just like a torso with the the shoulders that are flattened off. You know, you're showing us the, the way you shape it, and that the very last second, the whole thing just cracked and fell onto the table. And I was the asshole that was like, "I'm glad that just happened," because everybody else that was there, that was the new glass blower, has that same shit happen to him every day. And now they can see that Robert Mickelson also has that happen to him. He's not the guy in the studio that has no issues. So no. it's so important. No one like that. Yeah, no. Not even Banjo and Yushin. You know, you just don't see it. Yeah, and that's the trick is like I've always been taught that if you know what you're doing, you can fix a piece to make it look like it was never broken. And uh, which isn't always possible, you know, but that's that's the goal, (laughs) you know, to fix your shit. Yeah, sometimes you just have to sweep the pieces up and start again. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, there's a lot of times when that's the better course of action because, I mean, I've always fought. I always fight back. If something bad happens and I fight and I fight and I fight. And sometimes I win, then I look at the result of the win and it's still a loss. Yeah. <laughs> so Completely. Sometimes it's better just to trash it and say that's it and start again. Hell yeah. I completely agree. Yeah, it's uh it's it's so funny. I took a class with Steve Sizelove. It was uh, him and Coil did a class up at Tobacco Leaf up in Tallahassee. Mm-hmm. And Steve had a similar thing happen to him doing one of his bubble trap and it was a female torso. And I had mentioned to him about your demo that happened with your black figure. Same kind of style, you know, the female torso. And his cracked all the shit. And I was the same guy asshole in the class. I was like, hey, I'm glad that just happened. Because now these, <laughs> these young students can see Steve Sizelove has the same things happen to him too, you know. So it's, it's always an important lesson to learn. He's I, and When I interviewed him for the show, his uh, when I asked him about the sound of glass cracking, he, he's, his, his, basically his one word was uh, he's learned a lesson of non-attachment in life. With, when it comes to glass because you know early on we like to attach ourselves to everything we create and it's still hard not to put your heart and soul into everything you do but you know the shit hits the fan you got to start over you can't sit there and and dwell on that last piece you learn from the mistakes you made and then try not to repeat them i still feel like that uh the frustration level you know is real oh yeah and one of the skills that you develop in this business is how to deal with frustration and everybody has a different way of dealing with it. You, some people throw things, some people internalize it. And some people like me, I swear really loud. That's why that was my response to your question. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's my way of dealing with it and, and releasing yep. the frustration so that I can turn off the torch, walk around for a few minutes, come back and start again and, and be good. Because if you come back and try to work with that kind of, shaking rage because you're still you haven't released it you know you're, you're not going to succeed so releasing the frustration dealing with the frustration it's an important skill in life yeah but it's really vital in glass you've got to you're going to be frustrated bad stuff's going to happen you've got to be it's got to be a way to deal with it yeah glass i've always found and i preach all the time on the show is the, is the ultimate teacher in, in life you know getting over adversity and 
headaches, like all that stuff. Like how can you cope with these type of things? And I, yeah. I cussed all the time myself. And then I start working at Disney and I can't say fuck when I'm on stage. <laughs> <you know? laughs> and I've had, I've had two meltdowns so far to where I got to that point to where like, I have got to storm off a stage right now and get in the back break room or I'm going to freak the fuck out in front of people and lose my job. So, <laughs> yeah. so yeah, totally. So funny. Well, man, I'm glad you, I definitely glad you shared the background on the degenerate art stuff. It's something I've been wanting to ask you for since that film came out and knowing your background and your work. And, and I, and I, I appreciate you as an artist and of your skill set uh, being in this industry and, and being like a, in a mentor kind of situation whether you are or not, but people that look up to your work and, and appreciate what you do and can learn from your skills. I, uh, for myself and I know a lot of people feel the same. Like we definitely appreciate you being, being a part of this community. Yeah. Well, I'm very grateful to be part of this community. It's, uh, and very grateful to still be doing this at 68 years old with no end in sight. Um, I am a very lucky person and, uh, I don't know what else to say. Yeah, man. Um, it's a blessing to do this for a living. Absolutely. No, I, I'm, I think it's a, it's pretty Did awesome. we cover everything? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think now uh, will be a good time to quick take a quick break and uh, thank some sponsors, and we'll come back, and it'll be time for us to crash the kiln. All right, we're back. So uh, the crash the kiln round consists of uh, seven questions. I say six or seven, and I still have never counted how many questions I have, <laughs> but I know the questions, and... Uh, as always, if you want to give me a 30 to 60 second answer on them, you can, or we can also expound upon them as we typically do. And the first question I always like to ask is if there's any living glass artists that you have not yet worked with yet, uh, uh, who is it and why? Um, just off the top of my head, I'd have to say Jason Lee. And uh, I've never worked with Jason. I've always admired him as a person and his work. And I think that uh, a collaboration would be really rewarding. The other person that I that it occurred to me that I've never worked with that I would love to is Scott Deppy. I think he's a little less accessible than Jason is, but uh, still, um, you know, Scott, if you're out there, I'd love to collab with you. <laughs> yeah, man, he's a, an Jason. innovator. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be fun. Uh, as we said before, if you could describe the sound of glass cracking in one word, uh, what is it? Uh, you already know this. <laughs> the word would be fuck. <laughs> yep. And it feels so good to say it like that too. You know, just get it all out at once. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what are your current top five favorite colors in glass? Um, I have many more than five. I, yeah. I it's hard, right? <laughs> it is. It is hard. Um, there's. I, I'll start naming them, and I may go over five. That's I fine. I really like. Uh, Terps, Glass Alchemy's uh, CFL Reactive Terps. Their potion is also really beautiful. I'm particularly enamored of uh, a couple of uh, terrific uh, uh, North Star colors. Their their new um, Cadmium palette is absolutely to die for. The cherries and the bananas and the uh, Roswell is a particular color that uh, I really am fond of. Um, they also, uh, they've absorbed uh, Troutman Art Glass and I think my favorite black are both um, now North Star colors. One was a Troutman color called Blackjack that I use all the time for sculpting. And the other, of course, is uh, Jet Black. Um, I really like primary colors. So I've always been in search of the perfect white. I think I've found it. And that is Molten Aura's Lotus White. It's a shame that it's so hard to get, but it is a absolutely, it's the best white that's ever been made. I'll have to try that. Um, I... Uh, in fact, all the Molten Aura colors are spectacular. Uh, the, uh, the, their Gold Ruby was like, uh, it is, it's, it's, it's like the ultimate achievement in borosilicate color. Uh, not many people know this, but uh, Peach, uh, the North Star Peach, was one of the very earliest attempts to make Gold Ruby. Huh. It didn't work, but we got Peach. <laughs> yeah, I love Peach. It's a beautiful um, color. Yeah. So, uh, but the, uh, the gold Ruby color is absolutely beautiful. And all of the, uh, variations of that color North star now makes a beautiful color called karma. That's, uh, almost, uh, identical to that gold Ruby. Um, let's see what else. Uh, uh that's probably, I, I said, I said five, right? That's oh, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. So, haven't, haven't had the, the background in the hot shop, you know, and, and, the 500,000 colors that they have in soft glass, right? Gold Ruby was yeah. one of my favorite. And and I remember uh -huh. when the, when the Molten Aura line came out and it was kind of this furnace work quality color, 
it was it was pretty cool to see you know them, them stepping that up because it's it, I've always been jealous by the soft glass palette. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Not anymore. Yeah, exactly. I'm still trying to catch up on all these goddamn colors we have. I'll tell you what, man. I'm still using Blue Moon and freaking Caramel, you know. I love, <laughs> and I love that stuff. But still, you know, there's so much more out there. It's incredible. Uh, so recently, as you, uh, those that are following you on social media may have seen this, uh, but what is your worst injury in the studio? Um, you know, I went back over my history and I've had burns and cuts and things, but I think that this recent cut that I got where I sliced three fingers, coiling up an extension cord that had a hidden piece of glass melted into it. And I mean, I sliced these fingers, 23 stitches over three fingers. That's probably, that's probably number one on the, on the list right now. It's all healed up now, except that I've got numbness in two of the fingers, um, from severed nerves, but, uh, I haven't lost any function and the cuts have all healed now. Man. Yeah. I saw that, uh, from, uh, one of our, we have a fellow person buying a glass from us and, uh, he sent me the pictures at first and I was just like, I've done that before. I'd same exact thing. It wasn't as bad, but it was on my leg rolling, mm -hmm. rolling extension cord up and just using my leg to help top, make it taut so I can roll it up into a coil and it just sliced it back in my calf. And I didn't even know what the hell it was at first because, you know, a glass cuts so cleanly. Yeah. But your fingers are a little bit different. God, man. Well, I, didn't my... know what it was. I didn't know what it was either because when it cut my fingers, it sliced the nerves and it felt like an electric oh, shock. God. And I thought that the first thing I thought was that I had touched an open wire, even though it was unplugged. Interesting. That is... Because <laughs> it felt like an electric shock. Incredible. Man, I hope you heal up uh, completely. Oh, I'm, I'm certain that I will. The slowly, the, the feeling is coming back very slowly. So I, you give me a year, and I think they'll be completely restored. It's a good story to share. <laughs> For those that can handle it, at least. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when you're in a studio, do you watch TV, listen to the radio, or do you do both? Um, I have never been a TV watcher. I uh, listen to music in my little ear, earbuds, my Bluetooth earbuds. Uh, my preference is... I listen to a lot of different stuff, but if I come back the most often to contemporary blue, bluegrass and folk, that's what I listen to the most, even though I do listen to a lot of other stuff. Who's uh, some of your favorite bluegrass? Um, particularly fond of Union Station, yeah. um, Tony Rice, Nickel Creek, um, Bella Fleck. Things like that. Yeah, man. Contemporary. All, yeah, all my jams too. I love that stuff. Yeah, I got to see Tony Rice. Yeah, like Tony Rice. Years ago in, in Tennessee, I was up there. And, He's man, amazing. God, it's if I had to pick one artist that I like above all the rest, it would be Chris Thiele. Okay. The Mandarin. He's the mandolin player. Yeah, name for Nickel Creek. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nickel Creek's incredible too. Yeah. So good. Uh, do you have any glass blowing theme tattoos? No, I have one tiny tattoo that's uh, the Chinese character for love and my wife's name under it. It hurt. I don't want any more. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. You're a glass blower. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> I've never been an inker. I have met. I admire people and I think they're beautiful, but I've never been an inker myself. Nice. And uh, last question is, if you, uh, what are your top five favorite tools? Again, I don't know if I can limit it to five. Uh, I guess I would pick the five that I use most often, and I would start with my ancient U.S. Navy butter knife that is now two full inches shorter than it was in the beginning because I've ground it down. I've had that tool since the 70s. Um, then uh, just a plain old non-serrated pair of tweezers I use for so many things you can't even imagine the stuff I use it for. Even the flat back end of it I use as kind of a tiny paddle. Mm -hmm. um, I use my egg tool. Um, my little three quarter inch egg, which I wasn't even going to make a three quarter inch version of it until someone asked for it is now one of my most important tools. Is it graphite or uh, wood? Pardon me? Is, what's, what's it's the graphite. Graphite. Okay. It's my graphite egg. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can buy them from Taglia tools. Now I have a, uh, a number of paddles, but probably my favorite one is a small thick paddle that I use all the, all six edges on, you know, the edges and the, and the top and the back because I use them for all different sizes and things. I use that paddle really a lot. Um, I have a Sofietta that I'm very fond of. I use my Sofietta for all sorts of different stuff too. Uh, just to, 
it's nice to be able to puff into something when you no longer have a blowpipe if you have to. Yeah. You know? um, what else is really a lot? Uh, I have a striker now that I use. It's an electric striker. Because <laughs> ah, I don't, the old strikers went through flints and I didn't like them very much. And I, I hate Bic lighters. Bic lighters are dangerous and mm-hmm. I will not have them on my bench. But I have these little electric, electrified lighters. They're used for lighting cigarettes and they're just like a little spark. And they're rechargeable, and I have a bunch of them laying around, and I use those now. Uh, that's a tool that I use more than almost any other tool on my bench. Um, is that five? <laughs> yeah. Yep. What kind of torch are you rocking nowadays? Right now, I'm doing most of my work on a Herbert Arnold. I have a little 40 mil Herbert Arnold. I finally got adjusted correctly, and uh, really, really love. I I use that Arnold. There's just a few things that I go back to my little Mirage for. Um, but that's my main torch now. Yeah, I I have, haven't had extensive time on a Herbie. My brother has one. He has a fifty mil. And uh, about two years ago, I was in Colorado visiting him, and I got to we work on it. And for me, the Herbie is the most intuitive torch I've ever used ever. Like I turned it on, I was able to adjust the flame however the hell I wanted it to, and it wasn't as hot per se. I mean, it was hot, but it wasn't like I, I'm not gonna make a four inch marble on this thing. But it was it was just the right amount of everything to where. I felt like I was just in the clouds blowing glass. Like it was just, it was such a weird, beautiful experience. I don't know if it was just because I was super stoned on the Colorado weed out there or what the fuck it was, but it was so amazing that how just, in, it's so intuitive of a torch. I don't know if, if you feel the same way. Yeah, I actually, it took me a long time to get used to it. So having worked on a GTT for 20 odd years and the flame is so different. Yeah. The flame is so different and it's, it's, I still don't completely understand how the flame is made or why it behaves the way it does. It looks like a very reducing flame, but is in fact very oxidizing. It's also a very soft penetrating flame. It doesn't get the surface that hot. So it's deceptive how hot it really is. Mm -hmm. Glass, when you're working with a bubble, seems to melt from the inside out because it doesn't get the surface hot. It gives that impression that 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 the inside melts too. So they're really fine smooth penetrating flames i love the the ability to add a little air to it to cool it off so i can work the cadmium colors um it is uh it i use it for most things because it's uh rightly suited for most things but there still are a few things that i need a very sharp aggressive flame for and it doesn't seem to do that very well and i go back to my little mirage which i keep at my bench um for, for those things. So I have everything I need now. I've got a hand torch, I got my Mirage, I got my Herbie, and I have a Bunsen all on my bench. And there are times when I've got all four of them going. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I know when we did that demo down there and, and at LST and we both were setting up and I had my stuff out and you had yourself out and I'm very minimal with my tool usage, at least at the point in time I was. And I had my stuff out and look over at you and you have a very similar spread. Just a couple little things that you needed, but you had the blow hose and the hand torch and that wasn't in my bag of tools yet and uh it was a game changer when i got the, the hand torch and the blow hose set up you know kind of kind of for my glass which i think for a lot of artists it was uh, a very similar thing so it was it was it was just neat though seeing your because whenever i take a class the first thing i look at are the tools that are that the artist is using just yeah, to kind of get some idea listed torches and and blow hoses among my five favorite yeah <laughs> i thought you were thinking hand tools or something oh no no it, uh, I, I usually just say anything but your glasses you're killing your torch but yeah blow hose yeah. is a hand torch yeah there's a it's a must have oh, all right man so uh well again i appreciate you coming on on the show and getting up early today for uh, this sunrise uh recording we got here <laughs> no problem it's my it's been my pleasure i really appreciate you having me yeah man absolutely and uh before we let you go if you can tell us how we can find you out there in the world of cyberspace and then uh any kind of parting piece of advice Um, my Instagram is probably the shortest and quickest way to find me. R a Mickelson spell it with an E at the end instead of an O and you'll always find me and a parting bit of advice. Just be true to yourself. Don't try to be somebody else or something that you're not just be true to yourself and you'll always turn. You'll always go right. Hell yeah. Great advice. Yeah. Again, I appreciate your time and I'm like an hour South of you now since you're now up in the Ocala kind of area. So you're right outside of Ocala, right? Yeah, just outside of Ocala. So yeah, man, so after this COVID shit uh, goes away, I'd love to come up and see your space and come mess some glass with you one day. Would be fantastic. I would love to have you. 
um, after this COVID shit is done. Because right yeah. now we're not taking, even my family can't come visit us. Yeah, we're in the same boat. Now that I'm back at Disney, I'm, just, I'm, the, I'm in, this, in the middle of the cesspool. Even though I feel like if there's any safe place on earth right now, the way that they're doing things there, it's, uh, it's, I feel safe. Yeah, are they screening people? Yeah, they're screening. They got, I mean, it's, it's crazy how overly protected they are right now with stuff. We should all be that way. Yeah, tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> all right, brother. Well, enjoy your day. And uh, again, thank you so much for your time. And it was an honor uh, having you on the show today. All right. Thanks a lot. Take care. All right, Robert. Take care.